thoughts are not our own. And sometimes we think that what we do think and what we are attached to is from our own minds. When in fact, that could not be further from the truth. And to give a perfect example is when I was a kid, I thought beer was nasty. I, I thought having a scotch was horrible. But because the cool older people were doing it and it seemed like the fashionable thing to do, you learn to, over time, force yourself to enjoy it. Otherwise, if I didn't have those outside influences, I probably would have never grown accustomed or had even a desire to do that. So that original thought was not my own. Uh, I only wear these button-down shirts because that is what is sold to us in the United States. And I've grown accustomed to them, and so I like them. But uh, as I've traveled the world and wear Hindu outfits and Muslim outfits and all the different uh, and Chinese outfits, man, they're much more comfortable. They're much more practical, unless you're doing you know outside farm work or welding or construction or something. They, might not be so practical. So a lot of things that we believe are our own thoughts and our own likes and dislikes are not true. Like the American dream is a good example. Who came up with this notion that you needed to have uh, go to college, go to work for another company, and you buy your house, you have your 2.5 kids, and live happily ever after, then retire, then travel and do the things that you want to do. That, that's a farce. What kind of dream is that? Those are dreams and desires that are pushed upon us in a, in a farce, in a way to imprison our minds. It is something that I find uh, very strange, and I have people very close to me that thought as they were younger, oh, well, I'm going to wait until I retire so I can travel. Uh, and everyone hears that. Well, the time to travel is whenever you're in your youth. And today we have a couple of good friends of mine with me. My young, uh, we were young babies, and now we're 50, which is quite an amazing thing, is with me. And I bet you, Matt, could think of a lot of things, if you put your mind to it, what a lot of things that we think we need or we're told that we need we ultimately end up believing that's what we need, when in fact it's all BS. Like you don't need a big house. Or... I, no, I, I'm, I'm sitting here, yeah, pulling everything in, and I totally understand. I'm sitting here thinking, you got to grow up, you got to go to college, you got to do this, you got to get a good job, you got to get married, blah, blah, I have babies and stuff like that. But, you know, thinking about it, all the stuff that I have now, I don't want a big house. I had the big house. I had the fancy cars. I had everything. I want what I, what I want that makes me happy now. You know, I don't want to listen to somebody, oh, your house is too small. You need a bigger house. Well, I'm not going to do that for you. I'm going to do what I want to do now. And it took me a long time to realize, hey, look, I'm fine being 50 years old, kind of retired, semi-retired, living in a, a, a tool shed, you know, or something. Right. I'm okay with that. You know, so. Well, I think it's uh, it's funny just looking back on our life and whenever I was out starting my own uh, entrepreneurial journey, my biggest thing was, man, I need the, you know, I need the mansion on the hill. I, I need the, the private plane. I, I need, I need everything that was told to me that it's the measure of success. I, I need to have uh, these degrees. And so I was disappointed in myself around 25, right when I started becoming an entrepreneur. Like, God, ah, how am I going to do this? I, I didn't go to college. You know, I'm not a, maybe I'm not as smart as those guys, you know, that are going to go off and be doctors or yeah. you know, whatever. And, well, thank you. and I ultimately ended up having... Many doctors work for them. Yeah. But, I mean, you look at it now, like, you take the richest guys, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, they all dropped out of college. Elon Musk, they all dropped out because they knew what they wanted to know. 
Well, well, they also had the uh, military industrial complex back in them for their. Yeah, we'll uh, <laughs> skip that. Yeah, we'll skip all that part. But, uh, but now you talk about like, you know, these guys with the big houses. I have a lot of friends that have, you know, the big houses. But when you get to know these people, they can't afford half that stuff. You know, they they're trying to keep up with the Joneses. They're or, house poor. House well, poor. Yeah, that's what yeah. the why house poor. That or they're they're only. Um, I remember me and you as kids going to um, Dallas, and I remember a lot of people being pretentious, and and I thought they were wealthy. Yeah. And over the next couple of years of making friends in Dallas, because we only lived two and a half hours from Dallas, so it wasn't pretty common for us to go. And I came to realize that back then we used to call it the thirty thousand dollar millionaires. And now it's fifty or sixty thousand dollar millionaires. Inflation. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but things is not. It, it's still the same. Yeah, everybody wants to pretend to be something that they're not, and and most people don't even know who and what they are because we're bombarded with advertisements and marketing and brainwashing and news cycles and everything that is planting these seeds into our mind, like, oh, you you need to buy that uh, Nike shoe if you want to go jogging because that's the best. And we yeah. really want you to buy because we want you to support, uh, you know, slave labor in yeah. Indonesia or wherever. Labor, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm not picking on Nike. I'm just, you know, there was that big 60 Minutes expose about how they were doing that. I don't know what their practices are now. But the, the examples uh, continue on. I mean, we've had these kind of discussions before uh, that we're, we're programmed to believe we need all the things that we don't need in order to find happiness. You know, a, a little thing popped up. You know, I was telling Skylar uh, earlier, it was like, you know, I have all this land and, you know, all this stuff in my connex that I've collected throughout the years and traveling and it's, it's sitting in a box. And I'm like, if y'all want anything, just let me know what y'all want and stuff like that. So, Great example. My mom passed away a month ago. And uh, my stepdad goes, Matt, anything you want, take it. And I said, I only want a potato salad dish. Because uh, that's the only thing that meant a lot to me. You know, I want that dish, and that's it. Everything else I don't need. So it's like all these people wanting and wanting and wanting. Okay, well, you can't take it with you. Well, that's one of the subjects we talk about, too, a lot, which we're not going to get on right now. But everything is temporary. Mm -hmm. All of our possessions are temporary. Our life is temporary. Everything is going to pass. Yeah. This too shall pass. So uh, you know, we accumulate all these things, these creature comforts, and there's nothing wrong with accumulating creature comforts. It's, you just have to realize, and you come to realize, if you grow in wisdom and understanding and self-exploration, that... You know, this, this nice, comfortable leather chair does not make me happy and, feel, and fulfilled. I like having it because while we're sitting here talking, it's pretty comfortable. Like, you know, I can, you know my ass isn't going to get tired if it feels nice. But if it got torn up, I'm not going to go cry and think, oh, God, they don't make this chair anymore. I'm, what am I going to do, man? What am I going to do? And, uh, it, it is the... It's all these false paradigms that that are force fed to us that make life uh, or make people confused about what life means. Because life is energy; it's this energy force, and you, you can tell it. Like right before y'all got here, me and Jill are sitting down. We're watching a uh, another podcast of a friend of mine, and. There's a certain energy level between us. All of a sudden, y'all walk in, and y'all bring y'all's own energy. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, the energy changes. The whole dynamic changes. And then the more we talk, the more we're creating this mastermind with this uh, energy level. And that is, to me, the essence of life. Like interacting with the, these energetic forces, because as Skylar over here is going to soon not learn in dentistry is that humans are energy. We are creating energy. We have our own 
magnetic fields and magnetic pulses and we radiate this aura around us that is scientifically measurable. And so now we've said this many times on this podcast, we all know when someone walks in a room whether or not they're an asshole. Like you just feel it. All of a sudden the, the asshole energy radiates and squashes the mood. And you tell the same thing when somebody's really fun, high energy, all of a sudden it elevates everybody. And if everybody's just kind of mellowed out and relaxed and getting along, that energy just melts with everybody or or melts together. And it is a fascinating thing once you're cognizant of that and really start paying attention to how that is the... The, the fundamental nature of being a human is recognizing and understanding our own energies. Whenever we're in a negative mood or good mood and how to elevate our own selves and our own learning and, and controlling our fears and anxieties, that should be the American dream. The American dream should be, Hey, Oh, you're fearful of this. You're fearful of, uh, public speaking. Oh, you're fearful of taking this chance, which could better your life. Oh, you're being scared. You're going to take this other route instead. Well, in in our indoctrination camps that people call public schools, we we, we don't teach them that, hey, we need to learn how to overcome these fears. We we need to learn how, uh, as kids, you know, I was ashamed whenever my face would break out in zits. I'd be like, oh, God, you know, that you know, Mary Ann over there is not, she's not going to look at me today. I got to, I got to walk around like this. It's, uh, when in fact, people should have made it really clear to everybody, hey, this is a natural process. Everybody's going to get up, walk around and show them off. It's a part of you developing into your manhood. And once again, we do understand and know the definitions of men and women. And it is a part of being a man or woman, young lady growing up and so we're brainwashed and not even led in the right directions on the simplest things as getting a zit so there's no wonder everybody's so confused and we were just watching another podcast a minute ago and he said the the fantastic thing of uh, teaching these kids the American uh, not teaching them the American dream but that you can't teach kids anything whenever kids from zero to 20 are never supposed to sit in a class, sit for six to eight hours a day. That's torture. Yeah. And we all think it's normal because we all did it. Oh, look, I'm not too screwed up. And my buddy said earlier, oh, yeah, you're screwed up. And I agree with that. And it takes a long time to to work on getting out of being screwed up after being uh in a torture device, which is a, a desk for children, six to eight hours a day, nonstop. Like th- that is not part of the uh, American dream. What we're doing is telling, you need to go consume. You need to go buy. Oh, you like that new flashy truck on that commercial. Oh, your friend has one. Yeah, oh, I got to go get that. Yeah, I need to go work for some more... Uh, for, me, for some Federal Reserve notes so I can uh, so I can take the little hottie out to go to the All-American Date, a movie and dinner. Yeah. You know, why don't we go to a movie and dinner? It's dumb. It's really right. But it, well, you're right. I mean, no one should have to work 40, 50 hours a week to have two days off, to pay bills, to barely save anything nowadays, just to live. I mean, not live just to be alive. Exist. You know, exist. To survive. To eat. You know, well, I got to work so I can pay my bills to have electricity, and but I don't have any money left over. So, you know, I mean, you got to make some of these choices. Right. Well, Scholar it wants to be a, a dentist. All right. So you're going to go be a dentist. What is your motivation for being a dentist? Is it's before you answer is it something you absolutely love? Like you love the idea of opening people's mouth and looking in their teeth? 
Like, is that it's like you like, like you like, like when you're a kid, you're yeah. going, man, screw being an astronaut. I want to look at teeth. <laughs> now, since, since I came out the womb, I, I knew I wanted to be a dentist. No. That, that's, that's, that's not going to be anyone's answer. Um, I think dentistry really provides, you know, <clears throat> grow up from like a small business family. That's what it, essentially a practice is. It's going to be a small business. But you also have the opportunity to, you know, help change someone, improve their quality of life. And that that was the most appealing thing. Uh, you know, they walk in, when they leave, you have the opportunity, like, really transform them. But, uh, you know, it's, it provides a lot. Uh, especially if you're go if you're going into private practice, it's a good opportunity, you know, just kind of set up your own business and, you know, you kind of... Have you contemplated the idea of you ever set, because I, I think this is a really good practice for everybody, no matter what field they're going into, mm-hmm. is before you start to do that entrepreneurial dream or to become this, you know, attorney, doctor, whatever it is you want to do, to sit and go, what are my days going to look like? Like, how is my day? I've made all of my dreams come true. What does it look like to me? Is that something I'm going to enjoy? Yeah. Like, okay. Now, I'm just thinking of dentistry now because that's what you're going into. My days, I'm going to get paid by the time. Like, you're an hourly worker. I'm getting paid by the hour of this service. So this service of fixing teeth and making people's lives better by doing that, which is admirable. Somebody needs to do it. A lot of people have screwed up teeth. So you're locked in that location all day, every day, unless you have another dentistry partner, it's you or nobody, unless they're getting their teeth cleaned or something. So in order for you to be successful, you are locking yourself into a office all day, every day without the opportunity to leave. And I'm assuming you're okay with that and you've thought about it. Yeah, well, with dentistry, I mean, there's, I mean, my ideal long-term goal, four days a week, you know, three-day weekend, uh, a lot of the dentists that I shadow, they, they'd alternate days off. And, uh, you know, essentially when you have your own business like that, I mean, you kind of pick and choose if you I mean, if you wanted to go in that day, sure. Uh, if you didn't, you know, that's that's your call. But I like that freedom of it. Um, but it's a practice, and you continue to learn. Uh, you're going to be doing various things, but you're not going to know everything, especially once you start off. But, you know, as you continue to develop your skills, it's it's a continuing so you have, you have contemplated the idea. Well, uh, I think what you're saying is being stuck in one place for long term. You know, like, well, eventually, I mean, i like to settle down. Now, I mean, I chose a school. What does settling down mean to you? I uh, have a, a wife and kids, family, uh, pick, a, pick a, a spot that I'll be grounded to. Uh, right now, that's, that's not on my mind. Uh, I, yeah. I chose a school 20 hours away for a reason. I didn't apply to any school in the South, but I uh, wanted to go away for a little bit, you know, take care of the education and uh, like a setting that I'm just not familiar with. And then, so you could be dedicated to what you're learning. Right, exactly. Which is smart. That's a really good idea because sometimes we need to break away from uh, friends that can distract us. Exactly, yeah. I know, I know one person that is. That's good. That's probably a very good thing. And whenever I think of uh, youth and what we're told to do, you, know, you need to go get hurry up and buy your house. You, you need to get your first house. So when you, I remember whenever I was 18, 19, I had in my apartment, and as I turned 20, some older acquaintances would go, oh, when are you going to start house hunting? When are you going to, uh, you can always live in an apartment? Like that was a negative yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I thought it was negative for a long time and, until you start 
owning a home, and then you go, man, I'm locked down in this place. Yep. I, I can't, I'm no longer mobile. I can't just pick up and, you know, move to Dubai or go explore India with my, or whatever. Now you have this commitment. Well, that was, that was my thing. You know, I mean, me being a construction and traveling every year, two years, I was always on the go. Always rent the houses, never had anything. But it got to the point where nine years ago, I bought the land here. And I was like, I just need some stability. Not because everybody was telling me, hey, go get this, go get it. It was like, no, for myself, I need to be grounded and I want to have something. Well, you know? don't you that is the difference between the 50 year old man and the 18 to 25 or 30 year old man? Oh, a huge difference. Yeah, so that there's a big difference because those 18 year old to 35 year old, because I, I consider somebody below 35 a uh, kid. kid. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, they're just a young adult. They don't have any maturity or wisdom about them yet. So they, they lock themselves down, which to me, and I did the same thing because I thought from all the societal pressure that that is the normie thing to do. That's what I need to do. Because everybody has that. Yeah, everybody tells you that, oh, you need to get a house. Oh, God, you live in an apartment? Yeah. They're nice apartments. <laughs> they, they don't care. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, something that is a, a strange thing in this culture because it was increasingly becoming more popular where we will see people being mobile, they will leave and go somewhere else to work for a while and then go somewhere. But it's not as common. Most people stay locked down to whatever community they were raised in. Mm -hmm. Especially in the United States, most people don't even travel. If they do, it's only when a, you know, three or 400 miles of their house. You know, we were discussing that too. It's like, I'm glad you got to see parts of the world, you know, uh, and do that. I'm glad you're not staying in Louisiana. I'm glad you're getting away. You know, and it's, it's that breaking that chain. You know, I mean, look at us. We travel the world. We lived 30 minutes away, grew up 30 minutes away, and then here we are back in the same spot. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have that down for another topic next time you're here, or maybe we'll do it later. In the synchronicity of, of life, what is a coincidence versus uh, the magnetic pull? Yeah of other energies and you know me and you obviously being a forceful energy you know that, that's another subject but the, the main point of that is how, how do we go from being babies as neighbors and growing up and our parents moving and zigzagging everywhere and we're always living really nearby each other yeah. you didn't even know i lived here and you moved right down the street yeah. Yeah. and all of a sudden you know we're together again that, that's just a strange thing that'd be a great topic that is a good topic that's good. But um, it's a shame to me that we distort the idea of what what Americans and what people uh, in the Western world think of success and what is the measure of happiness. And, and mostly those thoughts are not our own, ever. Ever. Mm -hmm. You're wearing a T-shirt today because, you know, you've been told it's comfortable and now it's comfortable. Yeah. You know, if we were in India, you'd be wearing a Indian, yeah, and, and you'd be comfortable too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's interesting to me because so many people have not traveled. And when they do, and y'all know you know this, you can point out the America, the, the people from the United States so easily because they're the ones that start talking real loud, thinking that's going to allow somebody to understand them yeah. when they can't speak the language. Uh, and you just look at it and be like, man, you're a bad representation, or maybe you're the perfect representation of where I come from. You know, it is funny. We had these guys that we worked with uh, overseas, and they spoke three, four different languages. Mm -hmm. And they were they would all, always apologize to me, man. I'm sorry, my English isn't that great. And I'm like, dude, you speak four languages. I, I only speak one. No, hey, you if you ever go to the United States, most people still can't speak English. Yeah, <laughs> you're doing a lot better, pal. <laughs> you 
fit right in. Fit right yeah. in. No, and so. Yeah, so I think the, the more we think about how our thoughts are not our own, we can think about uh, almost every aspect of our life and go, that really was never, I, I didn't come up with that idea. Some, somebody gave me that idea. And that, that's good because we have to have mentors and we have to have uh, people around us to uh, guide and teach us and, and let us grow in wisdom. But then at the same time, we have people that are wanting us to buy their product. And their product is a college. Their product is a uh, maybe getting braces when they don't need them or getting whatever. So, Bailey, kind of like, do you think you could be successful without going to college, doing all this, and doing everything? Like, like you said, the American dream is do all this. Well, what if I don't follow that American dream? What's going to happen to me now? Well, now you follow your own dream, and yes. you then you become your the master of your own destiny, and you become a person who is willing to, as Robert Frost says, take the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I think that is really important that people understand that because as we start to evaluate ourselves. Because the world can't be better unless we evaluate ourselves and learn ourselves and why we think and believe what we do. And then we have to then we start to realize that oh all these thoughts are really not my own and I can make my own path. I don't have to do these kind of things. Like I really like wearing flip-flops now during the summer. I used to think that was ridiculous because I needed to wear my fancy uh, dress pants and my fine shoes. But now, I, I don't care if you like my fancy shoes. I really like flip-flops. This is what I'm talking about. This is what, this is what I, I'm in. So I, I just make my own shoe path. <laughs> Every, everything is the same. So for all of you out there, we contemplate for yourself. What thoughts are really your own? Why do you take the actions you do? Are they your original thought? Or does somebody force feed that to you? It's an interesting uh exploration and one that most people don't talk about or even think about. So with that, you can join us on, of course, everywhere, YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, and of course, visit us at Mystics of Texas and come out uh, every Sunday at 1.30. We'll see you next time.